Uh, greetings and welcome to our continuing weekly educational rounds here at Seclair, an integrative uh, holistic psychiatric facility located in Export, Pennsylvania. My name is Jim Ellermeyer. I'm a behavioral health therapist, and today I'm joined by our medical director, Dr. Safter Chandra. And a fruit fly just, just went by. <laughs> <laughs> You're easily distracted. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I pay attention, I guess. <laughs> um, in keeping with in keeping with uh, Seclair's philosophy of uh, providing holistic wellness, Dr. Chaudhary, generally we try to look at all phases of an individual's life: sleep, nutrition, sociability, spirituality, uh, every aspect of of their life, and perhaps offer enhancements to a person's wellness. And I understand that you are a little excited about a conference that you recently attended, and wanted to share that with everybody. Yeah. So psychiatry has been seen as a symptom management field so because it's set up in a way where if, if somebody has certain set of symptoms of depression it becomes a depressive disorder so we treat the symptoms based on conditions or presentations uh, are we starting with you? Uh, however uh, some of the biological uh, context is changing uh, so we are beginning to, many people would have heard about serotonin and dopamines and norepinephrine. So it's not uncommon for me to hear people coming in and having read up on internet or other ways, you know, one of these systems uh, operation at the brain level, which is a good thing. Uh, so the medicines were designed to address what would be called uh, some deficit states in the brain or over saturated state with the brain neurotransmitters well that's not changing as well so we are beginning to understand the functioning of the brain more effectively and thus the ability to be more targeted in treatment rather than a shotgun approach to address issues so today i thought i'll pick up a few ideas uh, which bring in excitement in the psych psychiatric uh, uh, dimension of care uh, and I also just randomly this morning was thinking that as the winter is approaching, uh, many people uh, in Western Pennsylvania struggle with some of the uh, difficulties associated with the shorter days and, and its biological implications. Uh, so not only the cold weather itself, but also what happens when we are living in this area. Uh, many people are very familiar with the vitamin D deficiency in this area, which can appear like a depression state, but it really is a state of vitamin D deficiency. And so we encourage people to get their vitamin D level checked. And then uh, I was seeing somebody who is actually a professor and actually you and I share working with him together. His vitamin D level was four. Uh, so he complained of fatigue, tiredness. <clears throat> um, even the last time I'd seen him, he said, I'm very fatigued. I just cannot get up and do things. Uh, and fatigue is the one, number one presenting symptom through the doctor's offices these days. And the normal, a normal vitamin D level would be? So in the usual A, usual primary care doctor setting, medical workup would say between 30 to 100. We believe very strongly anything 50 and above is a better range to be at. Uh, so, so it brings me to do not be fooled by the usual labs, when it's 30 to 100, one wonders what's the optimum level. And so in the functional medicine, we now know optimal level is 50 and above. And so those are the kind of details we get into in the biological psychiatry to address the issues of health and well-being. Uh, so that being one factor, I'll kind of allude to some of the other factors, uh, not only that I learned during this conference, uh, but also were previously learned thing which were reinforced by many researchers around the country anymore. So one of the researchers, uh, Dr. James Greenwald, whose uh, slide I borrowed for today's conversation, just signifies one element to this approach of biological sciences. So he picked up zebra approach as a mnemonic to address T taking care of yourself. Hormones play a huge role in women, in particular, and men more lately, I've seen uh, women's hormones 
play is such a dynamic cyclical changes in mood difficulties and or enhancing or or furthering the depressive conditions in men testosterone is very commonly deficit these days uh, and then thyroid hormone is common in both uh, in male and female uh, we'll just kind of skip the exclude here and kind of go on to the zinc and other minerals I did not realize how important some of these uh, rare minerals are for mood conditions and or even the biological condition. We'll kind of address that as we go on. Essential fatty acids. Uh, almost everyone needs to be taking omega-3s if we want to have a brain which is healthy. So one is a disease condition by itself. The other is what to keep it healthy as a maintenance model. Uh, so we'll address that as we go on. Exercise and energy, we have talked about vitamin B12, Bs, and other vitamins that are restoring and amino acids and proteins. Many people are deficit in amino acids, which really are very important in making neurotransmitters. So let me ask you a question, Dr. Chaudhary. In a normal blood panel, if you were going to see your, see your PCP, would they address many of these issues? Uh, uh, an astute physician could. Uh, ordinarily speaking, primary care doctors have so many different conditions that they are addressing from health issues of heart and pneumonias and allergies and whatnot that some, some primary care physicians are overwhelmed with the amount of people that they have to see. So increasingly, psychiatry is becoming almost like a field of taking care of primary care uh, responsibility in coordination of care. So um, we used to do just do what was called psychiatric blood tests. Now we do something broader than that, just for the sake of addressing uh, the issues, because we see people with uh, medical conditions presenting as psychiatric disorders. That's the necessity of. And one of the other things that was talked about in this conference, and is actually coming up in literature otherwise too, Given the subspecialties, people get turf, there's a turf kind of thing. Where it's an endocrine issue, you need to see an endocrine doctor. Uh, well, it's not my issue, you need to see an eye doctor. But there's not a lot of coordination between different condition states. And so at, our, at Ciclear, at least we are starting to have more coordinated care, even though we may not be doing the treatment ourselves, but at least we do the blood work and advise people to uh, become aware of some of these uh, deficit states that they might have. Which in turn, you as a psychiatrist and myself as a therapist to perhaps treat people in a more meaningful way. Absolutely. Just gives us a broader perspective of what to do and how to do that. Um, so the polypharmacy highway. So either you are going to be taking Zoloft or Prozac or Paxil or Buspar or Velbutrin or Celexa or Lexapro or whatnot. But in spite of all of these treatments that many people are receiving from a psychiatric office or primary care doctor's office or any other offices, uh, there are 40% relapse rates within 15 weeks, 20% incapacitated or committed suicide, 66% continue to have residual symptoms. So even with all these molecular sizes, people still are not having optimal health. And, and that's what is deficit and if somebody settles down for less than optimal, that's their call. But we feel that people should have a fully rich quality of life and not have just partial improvement in their symptoms. Um, <clears throat> so, so we are picking up depression as, as a prototype of, of a condition um, and, and using that as an example. Depression can occur as a result of imbalances of one or all of our communication channel okay so neuron transmission being the one which gets the most amount of attention these days well you can have low serotonin low dopamine high glutamate fine good enough well that's where the most psychiatric medicines are targeting these 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 neurotransmitters there's emerging literature about cytokines you know which are the inflammatory markers that people have inflammation in their body and this is now becoming almost in all medical societies, whether it's a cardiovascular or, you know, rheumatology and, and whatnot. You know, they're beginning to say, oh, there's some inflammation going on in the body that's causing the symptoms. And in the psychiatric field, we also know that people, due to inflammation, can have psychiatric symptoms, no different than having a joint pain 
how about the same systematic issue causing problem in the brain? Uh, so depression can be from that. And our hormones, uh, very common, low thyroid, I, I, I addressed that earlier on, and low testosterone. Uh, the thing that most people don't pay attention to is the food allergies. Uh, so many people are allergic to foods and it causes the inflammation and it causes the you know rest of the drama and the dysbiosis you know our bugs which we have in our body are they healthy bugs or bad bugs and and then the inflammation caused by the yeast and other 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 conditions so as you can see one may present as a depression but there's more to the story and the investigation one has to do or or else we can just put everybody on the antidepressants without knowing what is the causative factor. And what you're saying when a person presents for a symptom of depression, if we would treat them simply for depression without exploring other areas, we'd be doing them a great disservice. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because not everybody fits into, because that's where the usual psychiatric symptom complex treatment is not as effective as is knowing the biological underpinning for what's causing that state of mind or state of symptom presentation. Uh, so I picked up this is a complex medical slide, but I thought it'd be good enough for us to at least pick up on smaller elements to that. This is one neuron, and in this neuron there is uh, this neurotrophin, which is almost like the 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 uh, the miracle grow of the brain and miracle grow of the brain is something we make ourselves and it kind of then helps the brain cells to be functioning very effectively it creates new brain uh, dendrites and and then the brain connection and whatnot um, hormones uh, which is a middle piece uh, very very vital in the in the functioning of the brain uh, and, and it's not only one hormone, actually all the hormones can play a role. And so we, we want to talk about that and, and address that. Ion channel linked neurotransmitters. So there are neurotransmitters which need certain ions. So for example, they may need just magnesium. <clears throat> and, and if the magnesium is deficit in our body, so the reason I picked up these balls for uh, about, was it three years ago we went to New York for a conference together, Jim? Yes. Yeah. So there was a whole magnesium booth. And I said, that's kind of crazy. Why would there be a magnesium booth? I've never seen in my usual medical conferences a magnesium booth. Uh, so I, I, I saw that, but did not pay attention. And the more and more I've been uh, you know, understanding its implication, the more I'm recognizing the role of magnesium in, in, in our body's health and well-being. But it comes down to this neurotransmitter, some neurotransmitters uh, you, know, you know, the uh, neurons need some very rare things, whether it's a zinc or magnesium, to be able to function, basically speaking. And if we don't have it, that opening and closing of the uh, uh, of the brain neurons just doesn't happen. I mean, you can have all the food ready, but you missed putting in salt in the food. How would that taste? Bland. Bland. So sometimes a bland brand brand needs. Uh, more spices and more colors and if it doesn't have it it's not it's a bland brand um, so I'm not going to get into the G protein and neurotransmitters I'm just kind of highlighting the complexities of the brain functioning and thus knowing of how to be able to articulate its, its uh, effectiveness and then so forth and this is again one more complex slide and I have to present it because without that I would be very sad we would not want you to be sad. We'd have, we might have to find you a psychiatrist. That's right. So in order for me to treat myself, I want to kind of highlight a few things in this thing. This is a gene activation and silencing that the genes in our body, we have close to 20 to 30,000 genes. Not every gene gets expressed in every cell. So in other words, from two cells, we become multicellular organism that means from the two cells from mom and dad we develop eyes and retinas and kidney cells and all that now why that cell becomes kidney cells and not an eye cell because some genes get expressed and the other genes are open to make it whatever it needs to become so if we look at the 
some genes, if their gates are open, that means they're functioning, they can operate. So they're activated genes, if you notice there. And then the other genes which are closed, it's almost like that book is closed, and it's better for that to be closed. However, if you notice, right in the middle there is um, um, uh, SAMe. Uh, you know, so this is also a natural little product that sometimes people are using to be able to really address uh, uh, methyl, uh, um, I would say, you know, thing to keep a thing quieter and up, you know. Then L-methylfolate, which is right in the down here, I was very surprised, and that's probably one of the things I learned in this conference was that about 10% of the population is deficit in manufacturing their own L-methylfolate. And if you don't have that capacity, then you are going to be tired, depressed, fatigued. And there's no way for, it, for you to make it other than to actually take that as a supplement because the brain does not cross folic acid into methylfolate. And so I have a large number of people who uh, struggle with chronic depressive symptoms and some of them are starting to respond because I never really paid as much of attention to this particular molecule. And it's a very critical thing for the brain's operation, closing the um, opening and closing of the genes. And for sake of the fact that, you know, we, we use some very standard, uh, highly, so Stephen Stahl is probably the most, uh, I would say, thoroughly researched individual uh, who has absolutely no conflict of interest with many of these things that we are talking about here. And uh, so this picture really comes right from his book. Uh, that he picks up and he, he, he recognizes the uh, importance of these very important things for the brain to operate well. Um, so now bringing it back from that complex picture to the simpler one, how is the serotonin made? We make it from tryptophan. Tryptophan becomes 5-HTP. It becomes serotonin and that becomes melatonin. And if you notice, folate, the, remember the thing we were talking about, uh, you know, methylfolate, we need that little thing for the uh, TPH to become AADC. And if we don't have that, it isn't happening. Okay? And similarly, vitamins B6 is important and zinc is important. And that's why I brought up this zinc thing to show. If the zinc is not there in your body, either from food or some other source, you aren't going to be making the serotonin. And that just is that simple. And then the melatonin. So we can take the melatonin, but I'd rather be making from my own amino acids my own 5-HTP and my own serotonin, my own melatonin, right? So rather than taking millions of other things, but it's important to know that these are very important things for positive mood, relaxation, and calming, moderate equational stress, and healthy eating behaviors. Making sense? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so, so you're better understanding the molecular sciences, basically speaking. So amino acids level. So when we are asking people to eat healthy, it means... Uh, if somebody is a pure vegetarian and not adding to their molecular sciences or they're having low protein intake, they will not have enough amino acids. That's that simple. And if we are having insufficient hydrochloric acid and digestive enzymes, we would not have the ability to make, make good, good molecules and digest them. The antacid use is almost like epidemic at this time because people are sorely stressed out, so they have upset stomachs, so they take antacid, but we need acid in our guts, in our stomach, to be able to process these things more effectively. So we really are trying to deprive our body by using these antacids, um, and thus we bargain for more depression. So quite often what people are doing is not only get, getting rid of the bad bugs, but the good bugs at the same time. Absolutely, absolutely, you know, so, and also, that's right. So, so I just kind of, add a few more things about magnesium, and I promise I'll kind of pick up some of these smaller items. So it, it supports the calming actions of GABA interacting with its receptors. So GABA is a place where alcohol works. GABA is a place where the benzodiazepine works. So anybody taking Valium, Clonopin, Xanax, Lorazepam, it really is using a prescribed alcohol, basically speaking. And then thus we don't give people a lot of benzodiazepines uh, uh, on, a, on a routine basis. But remember, for our own body GABA to work well, we need magnesium. If your stress level goes up, your magnesium level goes down. 
And the usual blood work that's done by the doctor's office is actually does not even check the magnesium accurately. So we, we address the importance of gastric acid and how we need the gastric acid. God made this stomach for a good reason and the acid for a good reason too. So the amino acid availability for the neurotransmitter synthesis is dependent upon digestive enzymes and their activation by the hydrochloric acid in the stomach. So when we're taking all these thumbs and the you know, the modern day time, you know, reducing the hydrochloric acid in our stomach by all these uh, medicines, which is epidemic at this time, we really are reducing the acid and thus the ability of our own digestive system to make our own healthy amino acids that we need for making our mood synthesizing uh, mechanisms. And this would be my probably the last thing that ties into a blood work as well. <clears throat> so now we can do a blood work that we have not done in our office here, but that's something that at the national level they're doing quite a bit. That <clears throat> um, uh, HPHPA is a blood work, a blood test. And I'll just kind of explain that in, in a few moments. So if I have bad bugs in my gut, basically speaking, that bug is going to make a compound. And Ruthan, you have asked me to make this slide. So this is in your honor. <laughs> um, so if we have Clostridia are the bugs in our guts and we all have them, but if they take a root and become strong and start producing a lot of, a lot of their own chemicals, they stop the process of making our own neuro blood, uh, brain neurotransmitters because they block this thing right here, as you notice in the cross sign. So the brain can no longer make the norepinephrine and the epinephrine and the thing that we ordinarily would make. And thus, we have a, 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 a gut bacteria affecting the neurotransmitter systems. It's absolutely fascinating. And now we can prove that by a blood test. You know, here's a blood test that we can prove that. And then our, our office will begin to actually do this blood work. There are special blood work that cannot be done in your local labs, however, and so there's special labs who, are, who, are, who know how to do these just right. I'm not sure that most of our audience, Dr. Chaudhary, are aware that your digestive system and your brain are formed out of the same fetal tissue in your mother's womb. Absolutely. So they are, we are connected together. So that's why we have a lot of gut symptoms. And then now if you're not taking care of our guts, then our guts will take revenge on us, I guess. <laughs> revenge of the guts? Or revenge of the guts. Uh, and thus eating well, having healthy bacteria, respecting our, our original ancestors' foods, and respecting the fact that we can just be spending millions of dollars on unnecessary blood tests and gastroscopic things. I have patients who have gastroscopic done over and over again, but they still continue to do the same thing, and, and their moods are terrible. Um, so zinc was another thing we talked about. You know, zinc and digestive enzymes are very important. It increases the activity of the digestive enzymes. Zinc deficiency influences the ability to form hydrochloric acid. And we need that rather than trying to get rid of the hydrochloric acid, we actually need to make enough so that it causes, uh, it, it does, does the right uh, property of digestion. And so the zinc deficiency causes insufficient gastric acid production. And just this one item should, and I could do the same slide for many other molecule, Zinc deficiency can cause decreased taste, change in the brain chemistry, decreased melatonin, cause nausea, bloating GI discomfort, decreased pancreatic enzymes, vulnerability to more stress, depression, attention difficulties, decreased appetite, uh, avoiding the meat and inhibition of the EFA metabolism and so forth. So my point is we have to have these rare things either through food or through some other mechanism to be able to make our body function effectively. So with that said, I just want to kind of make a comment to, to finish up this mode. Um, um, optimal health is our goal. We can be 40% fatigued and 60% operational, or we can be 100% operational knowing what's the barrier and that requires taking care of our health addressing our health issues in a manner which is specific to each individual because each individual present uniquely what they have. It's not just one shoe fits everybody. That just isn't the case. And to summarize, if an individual presents to you with a symptom or behavior that's problematic, distressing, distressful in their life, 
if you would just look at that, that's a behavior. So what you always talk about is look to what drives behaviors and what, what is driving that into like a, to, to, like a to whole holistic picture of an individual. Absolutely. We, it's actually a very exciting time because we have biological markers for depressions and we can also understand the deficit states and also understand if there's some more of a trauma based depression. And for that, you need somebody who works with you very individually. And that's fun doing that. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing all this with us today. And may uh, I have a wish for you that may your life be uh, free from fruit flies. May fruit flies find their way out of here. <laughs> and the fruit stays here. Thank you for organizing this activity uh, for a period of time that you have. And appreciate that. And thank you, Mike, for doing what you do. And as always, our uh, free prescription. Uh, we don't need a, to be an MD to have this one. Fruits, nuts, and vegetables, unplug your television and perhaps take up fishing. And for a truly mindful experience, we ask you to consider fishing without bait would be a lifetime without definitive expectations. So until then, um, thank you so much for joining us today. And Dr. Chaudhry will show you how you can address us with any questions, comments, or concerns, or criticisms, and all are welcome. So we do this hangout at the community services. Uh, uh, to continue the conversation, please like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter under Seclear Life. You can also find this and other grand rounds on youtube.com slash clear video <clears throat> and find audio versions in iTunes, Stitchers, Stitcher, Speaker, and iHeartRadio. And also please visit www.seclear.com for more about us and other articles on our great blog. I appreciate everyone who takes the time to get this word of health out and may you all find this upcoming winter healthy, happy, and joyful.